Welcome everyone to the Endowment for Middle East Truths weekly webinar discussing today current events in the Middle East and the impact on Israel featuring Levant expert Tony Badron. Uh, as most of you know, Emmett is a 501c3 that works tirelessly on the Hill uh, to ensure that there are pro-America, pro-Israel policies that are emanating from Congress and uh, the executive branch. And we can't do our work without your support. So we appreciate you all joining today. We ask that you go to our website to learn more about our work and please consider a financial donation. Uh, Tony Badron is a research fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, where he focuses on Lebanon, Hezbollah, Syria, and the geopolitics of the Levant. Born and raised in Lebanon, Tony has testified before the House of Representatives on several occasions regarding U.S. policy toward Iran, Syria, and Lebanon. His research currently focuses on the relationship between Iran's Hezbollah model and regional states, as well as the history of and future scenarios for Israel-Hezbollah wars. His writings have appeared in publications from the Wall Street Journal and New York Times to the New York Post, Foreign Policy, and Newsweek. He is a columnist and Levant analyst for Tablet Magazine. I'm particularly excited to host Tony this afternoon as I've known him for many years and have followed his work closely. I urge you all to do the same at Tablet Magazine or on FDD's website at fdd.org. Today's program will be recorded for viewing at a later date. You can uh, put your questions that you might have into the Q&A. Please use the Q&A uh, queue at the bottom, not the chat function, because we can only follow the Q&A. And I will get to as many questions as possible later in the program. It's good to see you again, Tony, and thanks for being with us today. Lori, thank you so much uh, for inviting me. It, it's great to, to have you here again. In a recent column that you wrote, you focused on the theme of the difference between narratives versus realities. And given that we're going to be discussing some very important foreign policy issues where the gap between hope for outcomes and very real dangers is vast, I'm going to ask you to share with our audience on a number of topics where reality actually exists as opposed to politically and ideologically driven faux narratives. Before we get to current events though, in order to understand the implications of those events, I believe a good starting point for our discussions is the Iran nuclear deal, which has driven Democrat foreign policy in the region since Obama entered office, was put on hold during the Trump years and has been reignited as the focal point of the Biden-Harris administration's Middle East policy. While we've been hearing since about 2014 that a deal with Iran will stop its nuclear weapons program from advancing, that the JCPOA is a strong deal and that a new deal will be longer and stronger, we know that none of that is true. Um, you and Michael Duran wrote a truly seminal piece in Tablet Magazine just over a year ago entitled The Iran, The Realignment. And I'm going to put the uh, link to that in the chat function for everybody to copy to read at a later date. It's really, I urge you all to behind what you also called the Obama, Biden, Mali, Lincoln, Sullivan initiative. Uh, without giving too much away, I love this quote. I'm going to just read this quickly. A savvy Obama fooled the analysts by disguising the JCPOA as a non-proliferation agreement. In reality, the deal was a sneak attack on a traditional American foreign policy. It was and remains a Trojan horse designed to recast America's position and role in the Middle East. Sullivan and Blinken's task is to wheel the Trojan horse into the central square of American foreign policy and by brandishing their quote unquote centrist political credentials, sell it as an imperfect but valuable vehicle of containment. So Tony, can you discuss with the audience what the realignment is and why it's being implemented in a stealth Trojan horse fashion? Basically, what's the true role of the JCPOA in US foreign policy under both the Obama and now Biden administrations? Sure. So. Like you said, this is the central uh, foreign policy initi initiative uh, of the Obama administrations. Um, and if you look at the Biden administration as a continuation of the first two Obama uh, terms, uh, so we can spread it out uh, on the last uh, three or, or the, you know, the, the, the last three Democratic uh, administrations, that this has been their central foreign policy initiative. And the thing about it is uh, what Michael Duran and I described in the article is not, um, you know, fantasy. We didn't, you know, just come up with an interpretation. If you go back to the period uh, of, the, of the, especially the second uh, Obama term, you see... Um, explicit statements from the president himself all the way on down, in, including to anonymous leaks 
including to secondhand um, uh, reports by Isra high-ranking Israeli. I'll never forget this, for instance, uh, Yaakov Amidror in 2015, right on the cusp of the deal, comes to Washington, talks to State Department people, and writes a column uh, afterwards, and he's completely dumbfounded. He's like, this is, um, you know, these guys are moving toward a special relationship with Iran. This is unbelievable. This is crazy. This is not uh, just a, a, a non-proliferation agreement. This is a wide-ranging accord that extends uh, to security partnership. Remember, you know, people forget now what it was like during the heyday of the war on ISIS and all of that, right? And how breath, you know, how, how effortlessly all administration officials were talking about partnership with Iran in the war against ISIS, which became very um, concrete in theaters like Iraq, where current senior U.S. Ad official, administration officials like Brett McGurk, for instance, were working hand in glove with IRGC-led militias in Iraq. Um, where there was a, a, an ongoing security partnership. Uh, and um, so the idea, they were talking about it very openly, that you now start looking at Iran differently as a partner in the region, as a, as a principal interlocutor. Uh, you know, um, uh, uh, former President Obama spoke when he gathered, at some point gathered Gulf allies, and it was reported at the time, that he told them, you know, why don't you set up an apparatus like the Quds Force, for instance? You know, they get things done. And he speaks very, um, very flatteringly of the Iranians as serious strategic players, you know. And yeah, they may have some problems, you know, with their anti-Semitism and all of that and their terrorism and whatever. But, but those things can be managed, you know, if we can, if we can sort of give them uh, reassurances, which he again in 2015 called, uh, described euphemistically as equities, regional equities. So he, the United, here's the United States openly recognizing, and he said this in terms of Syria, right? Syria is not, you know, a war zone uh, where people are getting killed by the hundreds of thousands and where American traditional allies have vital interests from, you know, Israel uh, to Turkey, to Saudi Arabia, to the Emirates, to Jordan. No, rather, Iran has equities in Syria, and those equities have to be respected. That's the president saying this. They have to be respected, their equities in Syria. What is, this is euphemism, right? And this is a lot of, this is lang this is DC speak. When you use sanitized language to, dis to describe some really ugly uh, uh, realities. What is, it, what is an equity for Iran? What, what does Iran want in Syria? Iran wants Syria to pass weapons to Hezbollah to attack Israel. And here's the president of the United States saying, we respect those equities. That's good, we want those. Here's Iran now on the Golan Heights. We respect those equities. So um, this you know, plays out in Lebanon as well you know, as, as they start uh, you know, all, all under the um, the um, guise of the anti-ISIS campaign, which was a very important, as I you know discussed uh, with this article with Michael Duran and also in uh, other articles, that um, the ISIS campaign became a very they realized it, it became a very important cover for for them uh, because you can sell it in Washington. You can't really sell partnership with the IRGC in Washington, but you can sell an anti-ISIS campaign. So they used that to start you know, funneling or increasing support to the Lebanese armed forces, which are the auxiliary force of Hezbollah. So as Hezbollah was conducting its war in Syria, uh, the Lebanese armed forces were protecting its flank internally with U.S. support both in terms of materiel and intelligence and so on and so forth. Uh, and whenever anyone asks anything, well, you know, it's, it's anti-ISIS. The, the Lebanese are important allies in the war against ISIS. It was all a pro-Iran policy. So this is what I mean. It, it, it had 
it was it was sold as a non-proliferation agreement. Oh, we we just we just want to put Iran's nuclear program in a box, but in fact they had actually, and this is not me or me and Michael Duran saying this. This is their statements about their conception of the relationship, and that's what we called the realignment because here was. Barack Obama very openly realigning American interests and posture in the region away from allies like Saudi Arabia, Israel, Turkey, and elevating Iran as their primary partner in the region. And in fact, you, as you see, you know, the attacks on uh, then the Netanyahu government in particular as a, as a favorite uh, bet noir and then uh, MBS, obviously, in Saudi Arabia, become sort of um, central, uh, a central platform in, in their foreign policy uh, lingo, right? And, and so um, the idea, and famously, in, in, in the context of Syria, uh, then Vice President Biden at one point culminates, you know, this, this sentiment and says, you know, in Syria, the problem was our allies, right? The problem wasn't the IRGC or Assad, it was... It was our allies. They're the ones who, who caused this problem. So this, in, in a nutshell, is the regional view of the, uh, that, that the Obama team, which is still uh, in charge of the policy now. And, and again, I will point to you to two individuals, the most important of which is Robert Malley. Because really, Robert Malley is, uh, if there is a brain meld, if you like, between any two individuals in the Obama uh, administration with the president. A lot of people focus on Ben Rhodes. Ben Rhodes, uh, uh, Ben Rhodes is is nothing. Okay, the the real mind meld is Obama and and Mali, and that's why you see, as I note in the piece with Michael Durant, Mali writes a major essay in foreign policy at the beginning or right before the beginning of the of the uh, Biden term, and in which it's a template. This is the Obama foreign policy that needs to be completed, that needs to be pushed through uh, the finish line. He was very open about it. And then you get secondhand players like Sullivan repeating what Malley said with, I mean, Sullivan is not the guy who comes up with this idea. He's, that's not his function. That's not his level. It's Robert Malley and sort of systematizing Barack Obama's vision. And he's the guy now who runs the whole Iran show, right? He's the guy tasked with getting that done for Obama. Uh, the other guy who's in charge of everything else in the Middle East is Brett McGurk. So uh, these are the two people who are in charge of current uh, policy and the same people who are in charge of, for, of implementing uh, the realignment during the first two Obama terms, or, or especially the second Obama term, really. And, and in your article, you do get into the interplay of Mali and you know Sullivan and Blinken supposedly being you know reasonable minds in this, but and we don't have time to get further into that, but I'm, I'm glad that you made that clear about Molly's, Molly's role. Um, so, okay, we now know what the realignment is and why both Obama and Biden hide the true nature and dangers of the JCPOA. But what becomes very complicated is the interplay of the Russia-Iran Entente um, with U.S. foreign policy, beginning with the Syrian civil war under the Obama administration and carrying through to the Russian invasion of Ukraine under the Biden administration. First, can you spend some time sharing with us what you call the realignment mentality and why Obama invited Russia back into the Middle East after decades of the Pax Americana that had kept relative peace and stability in the region? Once again, Obama had a narrative delivered by the compliant mainstream media known as the echo chamber, which is, I guess, Ben Rhodes' biggest claim to fame is pointing them that. Um, but what was the reality with regard to the dynamics playing out in Syria when the civil war broke out, how Russia became involved, and the role of Obama's quest for the deal with Iran? And then similarly, and I know there's a lot packed into this, in that context, can you explain what you've labeled as the Syrian playbook in the context of the Ukraine war? With regard to that, you stated in a recent article, the administration's moral outrage really isn't about Ukraine at all. It's another tool in the service of its deal with Iran, which is the common thread between the timing of Russia's decision to invade Ukraine and the U.S. reaction to it. It's all pegged to the realignment. That's the lesson of the Syria playbook. So while the narrative has been that Trump's in bed with Putin, the reality of Russia and Iran's roles in the development and implementation of U.S. foreign policy under the Biden administration is much, much different than what they're sharing. Please explain how Biden's Ukraine policies 
have been impacted as well by his efforts to rejoin the JCPOA. Right. So uh, Obama's dance with Vladimir Putin in Syria uh, goes back to the uh, very early days of the Syrian uh, uh, revolution. Um, it's um, from the very beginning as U.S. allies, and I don't here mean only the Egyptians, uh, the, uh, uh, the Israelis, the Turks, or the Arabs. I mean the French, the British, the Europeans, right? Uh, who wanted to see, uh, you know, uh, U.S. leadership on the question of Assad, especially as he starts slaughtering people in mass. And um, they wanted to, uh, to find a mechanism to bypass um, Russia's veto in the Security Council. So they start a group called the Friends of Syria to try to bypass it. So what does Obama do? Obama uses Russia's veto by proxy. So every time anyone was trying to sort of push him in a direction uh, uh, to take uh, action against Assad or to lead or, uh, you know, a coalition against Assad, uh, he says, well, you have to go talk to Putin. The real, the, real, uh, the real path in Syria is for you to go talk, talk to Vladimir Putin. And um, this dynamic uh, helped uh, Obama in, in several ways. On one hand, obviously, to deflect this kind of pressure, but also uh, because he needed the Russians to get the... S Syria, basically, for Obama was uh, not just a distraction. It promised to be or threatened to be to derail his, sign his signature initiative with Iran. The Iranians ne need Syria. Uh, Barack Obama cannot go against the Iranians in Syria. Full stop. Anything and anyone who tries to undercut the Iranian position in Syria or, in his view, to drag the United States into taking that position against Iran, inter Iranian interests in Syria, that, got, that position had to be destroyed. And that's really what Syria policy under Barack Obama was all about. Um, so uh, Vladimir Putin, in that sense, became a, a very useful ally uh, in helping uh, Obama get out of all of these tight spots, especially with the issue of chemical weapons, because he had made a mistake, which he, he, he says later, you know, that this was his proudest moment, that he never uh, uh, backed down or, or was forced to take action to back up that, that, that he never succumbed to the pressure of taking action when, you know, when he backed away from the enforcing the red line. He, that's his words, his proudest moment. Um, so that um, he had made a mistake, and which was taken as a commitment that the United States was going to do something uh, once Assad uh, used chemical weapons. Uh, who bails him out? Vladimir Putin comes out, bails him out with a, with a deal to somehow uh, uh, ship out uh, Assad, supposedly Assad's, uh, all of Assad's chemical uh, weapons. Now, um, the issue with Ukraine is uh, so there's a timeline that I laid out in the piece. And if you look at all of these incidents, whenever there's this dance going on between Barack Obama and Vladimir Putin with the Iran deal always in the background, is that you have um, Vladimir Putin taking action, taking action elsewhere in his sphere of influence on the one hand, in Crimea, in Eastern Ukraine. And then um, you have... Uh, and, and with no response from the Obama administration or any meaningful response. Leading all the way up to 2015, right? 2015 is the seminal year because that's the year of the deal of the JCPOA. Um, during that spring, you had problems in Syria too because Barack Obama's uh, favorite regional partners and Qasem Sulei the late Qasem Soleimani, of whom he spoke so highly, uh, he, uh, these guys weren't getting it done in Syria, right? Because they're not that good. <laughs> so so the, um, there was a Turkish push in the north. There was a, uh, a brief uh, Arab-supported push in the south uh, via Jordan to kind of push the Iranians away. So th these guys were getting, were getting beat up. And the Iranians and the Russians were in talks about getting Russian support for the Iranians. 
the deal gets done in the summer of 2015, two months later, the Russians come in to Syria, right? So that's also the other part of this dance because um, Barack Obama needed Russian support for uh, his, the deal with Iran, but also the Iranians needed Russian support in Syria because they couldn't get it done. So uh, uh, the reaction initially, again, talking about narrative and reality, right? So the narrative spin at the time was that this is a quagmire for Putin. This is such a stupid move for Putin. All of, you know, a number of US, Tony Blinken being one of them, um, Barack Obama and some other flunkies in the State Department uh, were doing the same thing. Um, I remember one guy, uh, Jer uh, what's his name? Uh, I, I forgot, anyway. Was it Jeremy Shapiro? I, I don't, I, anyway, whatever his name is. Um, some genius who comes up with some big statement about how this is so stupid on the part of... And that same person two months later says, Russia now holds all the cards in Syria. Like that, right? So narrative, echo chamber, nonsense, nonsense, nonsense. And then, oh, sorry, it's a fait accompli. Now the Russians own the place. We have, we have, to, we have no option but to work with them. And then the next year... Robert Malley spends his time working with Vladimir Putin's personal envoy on negotiating the, the systematic demolition and surrender of the Syrian opposition throughout Syria from Aleppo on down. They were even talking about sharing intelligence with the Russian military so that they can strike people whenever, you know. Um, uh, anyway, so that, that's, that's the bottom line. So it's, it's a very tight relationship that plays out in Syria, and it, 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 it definitely bleeds over into Iran, into the Iran portfolio. And like I said, Vladimir Putin always gets payment in addition to getting payment in Syria, which is an interesting thing because everyone's talking about, you know, how NATO expansion triggered Vladimir Putin. But Barack Obama put Putin on NATO's southern flank for the first time in decades. OK, so nobody talks about that part. But now, all of a sudden, Russia is on the Mediterranean, which it had not been uh, at least in the, since the 70s, actually before. So um, nobody mentions that part of, of the inverse or the re you know, opposite direction. But uh, again, as, as the administration made clear that it was moving very quickly on the Iran uh, file, uh, and you know, there are other issues, obviously, not related to foreign policy, related to domestic energy, uh, issues and, and the ideology of the energy issues and, and um, Nord Stream 2 and all of that, which I explain in the piece, and I'm not going to get into now, but all of those signals from the administration gave Putin the idea that, okay, this is my time now to, to, to take more in Ukraine, which is the area that he had been getting, you know, payments, if you like, uh, figuratively, uh, from uh, Team Obama since, uh, you know, since its second term. Well, part of that, Tony, and um, I mean, we have a lot to cover, but in terms of Ukraine, I mean, Biden is, um, it, it, I guess, is kind of in, in bed with Putin in terms of Ukraine, which is, you know, needed Russia vis-a-vis -vis the JCPOA. And Russia was a key negotiator in these negotiations for a longer, stronger deal. Um, and so couldn't really arm Ukraine ahead of time or help Ukraine because, again, back to the JCPOA, Biden needed um, Putin. Is that is that correct? And that's and hence the you know the problems with with the delay in, in helping Ukraine. I, there have been other, I think, assessments. I'm sorry, by the way, I'm not sure if I got uh, frozen out or anything like that. If you lost, if you lost me, uh, but um, uh, anyway, yeah, stop um, speaking. Okay. So um, what happened um, was, I mean, there, there are issues of assessment, intelligence assessments, and what they thought. Tony, you're a little frozen. Um, Tony, you are frozen. Oh, okay, I apologize. Uh, you know, these things, uh, the, the wonders of the Zoom age. Right. Um, so I, as I was saying, there, there were other issues pertaining to intelligence assessments about how they thought um, the Russian operation was going to play out and how they thought 
um, that uh, you know it would be done very quickly, and uh, you know the Ukrainians will will fold very quickly. Uh, Putin will take Kiev very quickly, and and so on and so forth. So I th that there's that there's the Germans. The Germans you know have business interests with the Russians. There, I mean Nord Stream was all about the Germans and so on. So they didn't want that either. Um, Obviously, they were using the Russians in the JCPOA negotiations and so on. So there's a combination of things. Um, uh, obviously, the way things played out changed, you know, changed their reaction. They had to adapt. But um, in uh, what the one thing that that hasn't changed is the fact that Russia is still an essential partner with their uh, for their JCPOA, which means that the Russians are going to get billions upon billions of dollars through, uh, through the Iran deal, simply on its terms, like as the, as the people who are in charge of development and maintenance and, uh, you know, of, of nuclear, um, uh, nuclear sites and, 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 and so on. So there's that. Uh, there's, of course, the sort of uh, the channels that it creates for them you know, to, bu to, to bust sanctions via Iran through all the networks of the Iranians that the Iranians have, in as much as the Biden administration will not be enforcing sanctions on the Iranians anyway. So, uh, the, so th there was that disconnect, right? Or that, uh, uh, I guess, hypocrisy, you want to call it, well, it doesn't matter. Like, you know, the, the idea that you're, that, oh, we're, 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 we're talking big about Russia, but in fact, actually, our Iran deal is going to, uh, make a, you know make a mockery out of a lot of these claims uh, that they had about Russia. Okay, so <clears throat> moving on a little bit. I mean, so thanks to the Obama Biden administration, Assad remains in power in Syria while Iran has free reign to use Syria as a conduit for arms shipments to Hezbollah in Lebanon. Um, so this is a good time, I think, to bring Israel into the discussions. It seemed that Israel and Russia had a tacit agreement that Israel would be able to conduct strikes on Iranian activities and interests in Syria in order to prevent dangerous weapons from being placed on Israel's northern border in both Syria and Lebanon. Now that Russia has found itself bogged down in Ukraine, requiring it to pull forces out of Syria, do you have a sense of what this might mean for Israel's um, war between wars with Iran and Israel's ability to continue its military interventions there. Um, just for viewers, the term war between wars is used to describe Israel's covert and perhaps overt military interventions in the region that seek to stop Iran and prevent it from aggression against Israel, either directly or indirectly through its proxies. Right. Just a quick note that the, the Israel angle began before with the Ukraine thing, because the uh, it's related to what I was saying about the kind of this double speak on Russia uh, in, in Ukraine that the administration was using. They were, uh, they were using it as a cudgel to attack the Israelis, that they're somehow not being good allies on Ukraine for not helping Ukraine militarily. I mean, so they were actively trying to heighten tensions between Russia and Israel in the full knowledge that this uh, dynamic between Russia and Israel that you just described in Syria was very important to, to Israeli national security. And it was the result of them putting the Russians on Israel's doorsteps to begin with, right? So uh, it, it, was, it was really cynical uh, the way their messaging was playing out on, on Israel during that period. Um, the Israelis didn't fall for it. I mean, they've maintained a good working relationship with the Russians on that end. I don't know necessarily if I... Uh, you know, how, how far I would go in talking about a Russian withdrawal from Syria at this point. I'm not sure, you know, I mean, I, you know, people I, uh, I, I respect have, have spoken about some troop movement. Um, I don't know if this, reg if this is regular troop movement or if it's related to Ukraine. Um, they have moved troops before, uh, but it's very possible that there is some uh, gap now that the Iranians might be trying to exploit. It doesn't matter. What matters more is that the uh, Israelis have upped the tempo of operations in in Syria, and they've not, you know, they've not had to have any um, tension with the Russians in that regard, and they've been hitting a lot in Syria. Now, the problem with this is, which I mean, you described this dynamic. The dynamic is there's another element to it that that that's been left out, is that since the Iranians were basically given free reign in in Syria by the Obama team. 
and then came under Russian protection at some point or partnership at another. Um, th this presented a new headache to the Israelis because now you had an Iranian doctrine that actively was trying to uh, sort of uh, encircle Israel with a belt of uh, missiles. Okay, And they were trying to open up a front in the Golan Heights to link it up with the southern Lebanese front and to link it up with the southern Gaza front as well. And now they're trying to work on a West Bank front as well um, w w without much success. Um, so these, uh, these developments were happening. And, and so Israel had to now contend with the, with the incoming uh, influx of, uh, of weaponry to Lebanon via Syria and the establishment on Syrian soil of Iranian infrastructure. So now it became a double task. And they were, uh, but but they, they had tremendous intelligence and they were hitting uh, the Syria angle very successfully. They've managed to, to really um, uh, 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 hamper the Iranian um, plan in Syria. Lebanon, however, was left aside, right? So L Lebanon, and it, it was convenient for the Israelis because the Israelis, and, and there's a price to pay for it, of course. The Israelis wanted uh, to maintain this period of calm that they've had in Lebanon uh, since the end of the 2006 war. Uh, so this is a lo lengthy period of time uh, of, of, of calm, of, uh, of prosperity. Um, and so they wanted to try to prolong it as much as possible. The flip side to that is that you then have a, a de facto have come at an arrangement with the with Hezbollah in Lebanon that we kind of neutralize Lebanon. We don't hit in Lebanon. There's only really been one exception to that in 2019, I believe it was, um, when they they the Israelis did a drone strike in Beirut, very careful, very stealthy, in order to take out a key piece of equipment. In the production for the production of precision guided missiles in in Lebanon. So that's the other issue with Lebanon. So as the uh, um, Israelis were taking out convoys of weapons from Syria, the Iranians and Hezbollah came up with another plan. Let's develop domestic capability to upgrade the existing uh, stockpiles from dumb rockets to more precision uh, guided uh, missiles. Uh, or uh, projectiles. So this enables them obviously to, you know, to hit with much more precision in, in, in Israel. And that's a, a problem because now these things are being developed at a rate of maybe a couple of day, right? So you have, you have hundreds of them proliferating. Uh, so now there's a problem with Israel's um, uh, strategy of sidelining Lebanon. Okay, that's where the costs start coming up. This is on the tactical level. On the strategic level, of course, it's playing out against the uh, Obama slash Biden strategy on Iran, which is about to flood the Iranians with uh, billions of dollars and, and uh, sort of rekindle uh, an international par partnership with them. So that's kind of uh, the bigger, bro the broader uh, strategic picture. But tactically, and even, and even so, um, there's a price to pay by, of, with sidelining Lebanon, right? So, um, yes, you're buying calm. Yes, you're able to degrade some of their capabilities in Syria. At the same time, um, they are building up a different type of capability in Lebanon that is definitely going to have to take its toll in a future conflict, uh, which, uh, in, in which you know, a, lot of, a lot more Israeli civilians are likely to die and probably a lot more civilian and economic infrastructure is likely to get damaged. So um, the decision point for Israel is going to come sooner or later on this point, I suspect. Um, and, you know, I'm obviously, you know, it's not my call to do any of this. It's, uh, but it, I, I, you know, they may end up saying, look, you know, we, there is a cost, but this is the most, this is what we think is the best course. And they'll stay like, stay on this course. Uh, you know, do the kinds of sabotage that they've been doing in Iran, continue with that. And let's say, OK, we're not going to neutralize Lebanon, uh, meaning um, uh, take action in Lebanon, uh, you know, as we do that. So we'll see. I mean, a lot of it is fluid and, and it's going to play out, you know, in the next few months, I, I suspect. But this is a key issue for Israel that is not covered, that has not been covered in the war between wars campaign, which is, you know, the big gap of Lebanon in, in this uh, strategy.
So I'm glad you you brought in Lebanon. And of course, the the uh, issue with the precision guided missiles is quite frightening. Um, so many of us, you know, have been asking for, for years, when is Israel going to strike Iran when, you know, the focus also has been, as you point out, we're f- fewer focusing on what's going on in, in Lebanon with the buildup of that arsenal. Um, and so it, in regards to Lebanon, in a recent article that you wrote um, on the on the election, the recent election in Lebanon, you stated, you began, nowhere on the planet today is the gap between narrative and reality wider and therefore under more constant pressure from elites in a wide range of countries than in Lebanon, where the substitution of narratives for unpleasant realities may soon become the single largest component of the country's GDP. Take the recent Lebanese elections, for example, the official results of the May 15th parliamentary elections had not yet been announced when the English language media reports declare the outcome to be a major blow to Hezbollah, the group that dominates that country. Can you explain, Tony, what you meant by the narrative of the Lebanese elections differing from the reality of the results of those elections and what this means in a broader context in the region, including for Israel and her national security? And when I say what this means, I mean whatever results of the elections actually did occur. Um, And over the past several days, tensions between Israel and Lebanon have also escalated over an Israeli gas drilling rig with Hezbollah threatening military aggression and Lebanon's leaders asking the US to intervene claiming Lebanese sovereignty over the area. So perhaps touch on that as well. Sure. So before I start with the election thing, let me just say that the entirety of U.S. policy in Lebanon is explicitly built on narrative. I mean, if you can imagine that. It's actually what, how they, you know, if you ask them, well, what are you, why are you doing this in Lebanon? Well, because it helps undermine Hezbollah's narrative is the answer. So America right now, believe it or not, is conducting foreign policy on the basis of narrative. I mean, it's the most, it's the most delicious thing, right? Sort of the kind of the most fake place on earth, which is Lebanon, where everything is just basically stories and hall of mirrors and, you know, uh, just pure insanity has now been matched finally in the United States with a corresponding policy of just words. Let's just say things that, you know, and we'll indulge in this kind of cult of fantasy um, uh, and, and call it a policy. Uh, that's actually, again, it's not me saying, it's not my words, not my assessment. It's go look at any testimony on the Hill by any, and this is across the board, by the way, Republican and Democrat, that's, that's the beauty of it. Lebanon warps everybody's brain without exception, <laughs> Republican and Democrat alike. So, uh, but I mean, listen to them and they'll say, oh n- yeah, narrative, It'll, it's good to undermine the narrative. And people actually talk like this. So l- with that said, it, it, it stands to reason that was, this would extend to the election, right? Because what else are you gonna do? How else are you gonna talk about, you know, undercutting a military force that completely dominates the place? everything about it, right? And uh, uh, has zero uh, uh, opposition whatsoever uh, to to its power. And uh, and you're investing money (laughs) in that place that's run by this terrorist group, by this Iranian-backed terrorist group. Uh, How else are you going to talk about your policy in that place if not through narrative, which means just nonsense words Right. So the way they did it is to say, oh, so no, um, Hezbollah was dealt a major blow because it lost the majority in parliament. Leave, leaving aside the, the laughable notion that Hezbollah's power in Lebanon is predicated on its majority in parliament. Uh, this is this is uh, ridiculous for two just easily pointed out reasons. Right. One is that. In 2005, there were elections, and in 2009, there were elections. Both these elections, um, a coalition of so-called anti-Hezbollah forces won the majority. Hezbollah and its allies didn't win the majority. What happened? This is a decade that we're talking about. What happened during that decade? Did Hezbollah get weaker or did Hezbollah get stronger during that decade? From 2005 to uh, 2010. Okay, what happened? Sorry, to 2015. What happened during that decade? Uh, uh, what happened in the three years from 
2012 to 2015, when they were fighting in Syria and expanding in Syria, and they're fighting in Iraq and fighting in Yemen and expanding their foot, uh, uh, footprint throughout the region. Uh, so it's absurd. It's, it's just gibberish to talk about it, about Hezbollah's power and a major blow to Hezbollah's power on, on using these categories. Second, even on its own terms, it's false. Hezbollah and its allies have about 60, depending on how you count, anywhere from 60 to maybe 62 uh, members of arms. So they're, they're a handful shy of a majority, which they have since shown twice that they're able to actually uh, pull together. They are able to get 65 MPs from all the other riffraff uh, in, in the Lebanese political scene to push stuff in appointments and, and things in, in, in through parliament if they want to, if they need to. It doesn't affect them even on its own terms. It's just, it's just basically a lie. Why is it a lie? What's the purpose of the lie? It's a lie by the Lebanese. Why is it a lie by the Lebanese? It's a lie by the Lebanese because the Lebanese DNA is to drag outside powers into perpetual investment in their affairs, okay? And especially if it leads to uh, brokering a deal between uh, uh, multiple outside players to have a partnership together, meaning the United States and Iran. If they can come together, over, that's why all the Lebanese were extremely happy with the Iran nuclear deal because it, 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 it professed precisely that uh, partnership and they would feel its consequences domestically, that now they have an agreement with the United States, which means what? Which means the United States would keep Israel at bay and nobody can touch our stuff and we can, have, we can co co go on living with our uh, sort of, uh, um, however you want to look at it, miserable or tragic lives or however you want to look at it. Um, and then everyone keeps paying. And when the Saudis said in 2017, hey, we're getting off the crazy train. We're no longer pumping money to you, Iranian satrapy, uh, and with all your nonsense and lies. They went berserk. The Lebanese became the most anti-Saudi voices you can possibly imagine. They cursed out MBS like you wouldn't believe. And um, since then have been trying aggressively to get the Saudis to invest again. And in this effort, they are joined by both France and the United States. Since uh, uh, at least a year ago, at least, if not more, in an, uh, there was one episode, unprecedented. The U.S. ambassador to Lebanon and the French ambassador to Lebanon both took a joint trip to Saudi Arabia to lobby the Saudis to pay money to the Lebanese and to get re-engaged in Lebanese affairs. That's how crazy. Meaning what? They want Saudi Arabia to underwrite Iranian equities and their understanding and partnerships with the Iranians. The French do it very openly. The French have no qualms. They meet with Hezbollah all the time. The French president told Hezbollah in no uncertain terms, I want to work with you in Lebanon. He's, he has investments in, we'll get to the maritime because this is re relevant to that. He has investments with Total in, in offshore energy in Lebanon. Um, a French company is managing the Beirut port. Uh, and the Tripoli port, and they, you know, they have other plans for electricity and, and so on. So it's, it's, uh, the French are very cynical about it. They don't care. The United States, obviously, because of our laws against Hezbollah and so on, has have to be more, uh, have to dissimulate more. So they create other fictions. They create, again, talk about narratives and fiction. Yeah. They create a fiction, the fiction, they call it the Lebanese state, right? So we, uh, the Lebanese state is different than Hezbollah, right? And we can talk with, uh, allies of Hezbollah in the Lebanese system to talk directly through Hezbollah, to, to Hezbollah, indirectly to Hezbollah, like they had just the other day in Washington, the head of general security, who's a Hezbollah ally, for instance. So they use him. They talk to the Speaker of Parliament on the maritime to negotiate the maritime borders. He's a Hezbollah uh, front uh, and partner. So, um, th so they talk with Hezbollah all the time. Right? And, and they pass intelligence to Hezbollah. That's what they did during the Obama years, for instance, via the Lebanese army and so on. And they call that fiction the Lebanese state. 
So it helps them. The French do away with that fiction. They just simply talk to Hezbollah directly. But that's kind of what you have uh, in Lebanon. And the maritime, as part of this fiction, they built this maritime thing. Now, in fairness, this, this idiocy started with the um, uh, Pompeo State Department. In, 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 amazingly, in the last months, in October 2020, in the last months of the administration, right before they lost the election, uh, they launched this initiative to restart talks between Israel and Lebanon with the explicit purpose of getting Lebanon to benefit financially from uh, gas exploration uh, in, in, and gas extraction, um, meaning Hezbollah to benefit. <laughs> and I say that legally, I'm not saying it, you know, metaphorically. Legally, Hezbollah is part of the government. Hezbollah is part of parliament. Legally, Hezbollah has access to the Lebanese budget. Anything you get, and this is to say nothing of the fact that all this investment is in South Lebanon, uh, which is where all these companies would be investing. That's Hezbollah land too, right? So uh, they started this, uh, and, and obviously team Biden picked it up and ran with it. To, to get the um, Lebanese and the Israelis to agree on a maritime border so that they can extract gas. So now um, the Israeli, so obviously what the, the first thing the Lebanese did is they upped the, their claim. Instead of you know, working on that defined area that was so-called so disputed, which really, I mean, shouldn't have, it should, we shouldn't have entertained any of that nonsense because they, it's them who had filed their line initially and they messed it up. So whatever, but anyway, there was a, there was a, a triangle kind of, of a of disputed area. They increased it by, by several hundred kilometers. So it went from being like 860 kilometers to like 1450 kilometers, which extended deep into Israeli territorial waters because they wanted to grab all of that uh, energy uh, resources in there. And most importantly, they didn't want any agreement where there would be, um, which I mean, Thank, thankfully, I mean, it's incredible that the United States is actually even advocating shared resources and fields between Israel and Hezbollah. The, the, the policy would make Israel and Hezbollah partners. I mean, it's, it's insanity. But um, uh, so they didn't want that. They rejected it. And now they're threatening force because the mediation stopped. Uh, and, and, and the funny thing about it is who are the people who are making the most maximalist pl claims? It's all these so-called reformist MPs whose election was supposedly the major blow to Hezbollah. They're the ones now who are fronting for Hezbollah's maximalism and using Hezbollah's threat by proxy <laughs> to blackmail the Americans to come back and give them a better deal. So again, that's why I say this is all gibberish. Hezbollah runs the place. That's why I say Lebanon equals Hezbollah is my mantra. Uh, that for those who follow me on Twitter, I use that all the time. It's structural. It doesn't, it, you know, all this other nonsense that people try to say is just, it's not real. Um, so before I get to the audience questions, I have one more topic that you've touched on. I want to, I want you to elaborate a little bit more on this. Um, when you talk about actually the Biden administration running with something that was started under the Trump administration, I think that the um, attempted uh, negotiations between the Saudis and the Israelis is something that we're seeing major spin coming from right now by the Biden administration. The Abraham Accords are obviously a, a Trump um, initiative success story, and um, the Saudis were something that had you know that, that had started under them uh, under the Trump administration. There was actually um, a Wall Street Journal piece yesterday that jumped on the Biden spin that Biden is going to make peace between the Saudis and the Israelis. Now, we know that, you know, but Biden came into office really alienating the Saudis, um, pushing them away, anti-Saudi policies. We don't have to get into the details of those. But um, the, the reality is that now Biden needs Saudi oil. And so if there is peace between the Israelis and Saudis, I can't imagine that the world will believe that it was actually Biden that did it. But can you talk a little bit about the Abraham Accords, Saudi-Israeli relationships and how the Saudis play into all of this stuff with Iran um, and give us a little bit more color on what you can expect maybe if Biden does make it over to the Mideast this summer? Yeah, I mean, I'll just note that the first, literally the first policy, uh, foreign policy action that the team, uh, the Biden team took 
when, literally within days of coming into office, was to remove the Houthi militia from the terror list. That's the number one thing, right? Forget all the rhetoric. Uh, so that's how we, we tie it back to realignment. That's what we mean by realignment, right? You downgrade allies, you elevate Iran. Um, you, 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 you take Iran's side in, or, or at least say, no, you know, you should negotiate with them on this. You should, you should share the neighborhood with them, blah, 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 right? Even when it's on your doorstep, even when it's affecting um, U.S. strategic interests and allied strategic interests, you know, to put IRGC militias on the Red Sea and the chokeholds of, uh, of uh, oil ship, shipments uh, to the world. Anyway, um, you can see, you, you hit, I think, the, the essential point, uh, Laurie, that this is about, this is the, the fallout from their domestic energy policy, which is another ideological uh, platform of theirs. Uh, they basically crippled the U.S. energy industry. They, they, I mean, that's the, one of, speaking of the first thing they did, Keystone. They, I mean, they've systematically been destroying the American energy industry. Um, and um, we're coming up to an election and gas prices are anywhere from five to seven dollars plus, uh, you know, and so um, it's a problem on the one hand. On the other hand, there's another problem, which is that, you know, uh, their... Um, the, the, this doctrine of clean energy and green new deal and all of that is so that they can't abandon that from their other uh you know from the from 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 within their democratic ranks they can't abandon that so you have those two things that are driving the policy and he wants to go and get the saudis to bail him out pure and simple and on that they're putting all this spin to make it some major geostrategic play about the abraham accords which I'll remind your audience that they took literally months. It was pathological where they refused to utter the words. People would push them, push them, push them, and they would refuse to utter the words. Abraham Accords. I mean, they're that, I mean, it's, it's bizarre. Um, so, I mean, now, they're, now they've found use for it, so they're using it, but it has nothing to do with that. And it, it, it was, they have no role in it. Uh, <laughs> This is a Saudi move that started in 2017, okay, uh, under Trump, um, and they took the initiative to take the uh, to take claim of the uh, two islands that were in Egypt's custody, and now they're taking them back, which would place uh, Saudi Arabia on Israel's border. It would share a border with Israel, so that's a very meaningful uh, move on their part, which can set the stage for all kinds of trade and maybe security related uh, um, agreements down the road. This is not, it, this was supposed to be the culmination under Trump. Unfortunately, it got cut uh, midway. I find it very difficult to believe with, uh, and, I, and I'm, I'm very sure that the Biden administration approaches it this way. If not, if only, if you listen to them postponing and how tortured their language is on visiting Saudi Arabia, but also how they're blaming Israel <laughs> for it, that somehow the, the weakness of the Israeli government precludes them visiting <laughs> Israel and, and all of that. So I, I think this is just really a, a veneer to cover for something much more simple and uh, uh, parochial, uh, domestic, is that he needs Saudi Arabia to bail him out on oil prices, full stop. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to turn to the Q and A. We don't have a lot of time, and I apologize to those who have put questions in. I'll try to we'll try to hit on them quickly. Um, somebody asked why has President Obama been so pro Iran? It is so obvious that Iran is a rogue state, and yet Mr. Obama does not seem to care about that. How does he benefit from helping Iran? And yeah. I, that's the realignment. Yeah, it's the realignment. I mean, the motivation for it, we can speculate. I think uh, a lot of it is is uh, a sensibility. Uh, I, uh, in, the, in, in, in the beginning, I tried to think about it in terms of accepting or, or trying to entertain their own rationales for it as some sort of a cockamamie uh, geopolitical idea or whatever. I've since abandoned that uh, line of thinking. I think it's uh, psychological, sociological, and just a matter of sensibility um, and attraction. And that's where, that's where I am at this point. 
Uh, so someone asked, Iran has now enough enriched uranium to build a nuclear weapon. Why, do you, why, in your opinion, is Israel waiting to pulverize Fordo? Is Biden um, warning Israel not to do it? I, I can't speak to why the Israelis are, are or aren't. I mean, they're doing a lot of sabotage uh, operations, as you know, a lot of assassinations and, you know, what that, how, what that can do. And there are a lot of things they can do short of bombing. Uh, uh, remember, you know, the enriched uranium is only one part. They still need to weaponize it and deliver it and, and so on and so forth. So there are still, that's why they need American and international. That's what the JCPOA incredibly does. The JCPOA puts American and international protection over their nuclear program, right? It, it, it gives them an, an international protective umbrella to develop it. They're not capable of developing it on their own. And that's, that's the insane aspect of the JCPOA is that basically its objective is to lead you to a nuclear Iran, not the opposite. Um, there was a report earlier today that Erdogan is considering going into um, northern Syria, I mean, yeah, northern Syria to, um, to attack the Kurds who are allies of the US. Do you have a sense of the implications of that, whether it will happen? Uh, I don't know whether it will happen. Um, uh, it wouldn't be the first time. Obviously, they, Turkey has very real national security interests in northern Syria and the PKK, which is what our quote unquote allies in northern Syria are. They're a terrorist group designated by the United States and the European Union. And it was part of the Obama realignment play in Syria to use the PKK, both to block Turkey on the one hand and to find a way that allows for the United States to have a partner that is actually not anti-Assad, that kind of can, can maintain a cordial relationship with Assad. And I'll remind you that in northwest Syria, in um, not quite in the area, but adjacent to the area where now, uh, where the Turks had already done an operation, uh, the PKK and the IRGC and the Assad regime and, Hezbollah and the Russians all worked very, together to take Aleppo down. The PKK was instrumental in the fall of Aleppo. Um, right, working with Hezbollah and the Assad regime and so on and so forth. So they were very obviously, and you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an anti-Turkish um, movement. Uh, it's an enemy of Turkey. And so if so there are other considerations for Erdogan, obviously domestic considerations in terms of uh, refugees that Turkey has been hosting and their desire to repatriate some of them. And maybe uh, an attempt like Israel, perhaps with the weapon strikes, maybe to take advantage of Russian um, um, uh, involvement in Ukraine to try to push through something. I don't know. Uh, we'll see if it happens, but there are possible explanations for it. Um, is there anyone in Congress or the Senate, Menendez pointed out, who has spoken out about the U.S. realignment in the Middle East, where the supporters of Israel, you know, um, uh, they, somebody asked if you've testified, and I believe you have testified, although I'm sure, I, I don't know on this particular topic, you have testified before Congress, but are there, is there a way to turn to Congress to help push back against this insane policy? Uh, sure, there, I mean, there are, and, uh, and there are lots of things that are being considered and, uh, you know, in terms of sanctions and, uh, or preventing removal of certain sanctions or imposing other sanctions and so on. But we have to remember, I mean, that the executive has tremendous leeway uh, in conducting foreign policy. And a lot of that can, you know, they can, as long as they're in power, right, they can do a lot of damage. And, uh, uh, you know, you can try to lay the groundwork and mitigate some of it. Like, for instance, what has happened with the IRGC sanctions, that, you know, that, that's a good example, uh, in as much as uh, Rob Malley has been maniacally trying to remove them. Um, and, and that's an incredible story that we have news of uh, an, I, an active IRGC operation plot on U.S. soil to assassinate and murder Americans, including American dip, former diplomats, specifically high-ranking former diplomats. And as this story comes out, and it doesn't come out via the administration, as the story comes out, the administration does not stop for one second its negotiations with the Iranians. Rather, it's kind of kind of negotiating the terms <laughs> of what's acceptable and what's not acceptable, even as the Iranians think, no. And, and, and then they spun it that we try, oh no, we, we're definitely getting the Iranians to promise, just like we promised with the Iranian nuclear fatwa, that they would never <laughs> you know, turn it into a, weaponize the, the, their nuclear program, which of course is 
complete nonsense, right? Well, we'll ask them to promise not to assassinate Americans. And this was, I mean, this was the actual position that they gave in testimony to Congress that when asked on this. The fact is that they were negotiating, negotiating terms of <laughs> murdering Americans with this terrorist regime. And it's not the first time. Remember the Cafe Milano incident um, when they tried to blow up, you know, and Barack Obama didn't make a peep at the time and they continued, and no problem. Um, so, uh, yeah, so the IRGC issue is, is, is an example of that, for instance. Yeah, so I, I actually was at an Iran conference in DC a couple months ago, about two months ago, and Brian Hook spoke, and he was surrounded by Secret Service security. Oh, yeah. was was crazy. I mean, his, yeah. you know, he can't go anywhere now. Yeah, you know, that came out, and th that story embarrassed him, but it didn't come, didn't come out from them, and more importantly, it didn't stop them from continuing uh, the right. negotiation. So it's, it's after one, and unfortunately, we have to end the conversation. But Tony, thank you so much. You are, as always, insightful, brilliant. Um, you, your work is tremendous. Again, I urge everybody to follow Tony at Tablet Magazine and follow FDD's work. Uh, can't thank you enough for being here and what you're doing. Thank you all for joining us as well. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. You too.